The Locket by Kate Chopin. One night in autumn, a few men were gathered about a fire on the slope of a hill. They belonged to a small detachment of Confederate forces and were awaiting orders to march. Their gray uniforms were worn beyond the point of shabbiness. One of the men was heating something in a tin cup over the embers. Two were lying at full length a little distance away, while a fourth was trying to decipher a letter and had drawn close to the light. He had unfastened his collar and a good bit of his flannel shirt front. "'What's that you got around your neck, Ned?' asked one of the men lying in the obscurity. Ned, or Edmund, mechanically fastened another button of his shirt and did not reply. He went on reading his letter. "'Is it your sweetheart's picture?' "'Tain't no gal's picture,' offered the man at the fire. He had removed his tin cup and was engaged in stirring its grimy contents with a small stick. "'That's a charm. Some kind of hoodoo business that one of them priests gave him to keep him out of trouble. I know him, Catholics. That's how them Frenchies got promoted and never got a scratch since he's been in the ranks. Hey, French, ain't I right?' Edmund looked up absently from his letter. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Ain't that a charm you got round your neck?' It must be, Nick, returned Edmund with a smile. I don't know how I could have gone through this year and a half without it. The letter had made Edmund heartsick and homesick. He stretched himself on his back and looked straight up at the blinking stars. But he was not thinking of them, nor of anything but a certain spring day when the bees were humming in the clematis, when a girl was saying goodbye to him. He could see her as she unclasped from her neck the locket which she fastened about his own. It was an old-fashioned golden locket bearing miniatures of her father and mother with their names and the date of their marriage. It was her most precious earthly possession. Edmund could feel again the folds of the girl's soft white gown and see the droop of the angel's sleeves as she circled her fair arms about his neck. Her sweet face, appealing, pathetic, tormented by the pain of parting, appeared before him as vividly as life. He turned over, burying his face in his arm, and there he lay, still and motionless. The profound and treacherous night with its silence and semblance of peace settled upon the camp. He dreamed that the fair Octavie but brought him a letter. He had no chair to offer her and was pained and embarrassed at the condition of his garments. He was ashamed of the poor food which comprised the dinner at which he begged her to join them. He dreamt of a serpent coiling around his throat, and when he strove to grasp it, the slimy thing glided away from its clutch. Then his dream was clamor. Get your duds! You, Frenchy! Nick was bellowing in his face. There was what appeared to be a scramble and a rush rather than any regulated movement. The hillside was alive with clatter in motion, with sudden upspringing lights among the pines. In the east, the dawn was unfolding out of the darkness. Its glimmer was yet dim in the plain below. What's it all about? wondered a big blackbird perched on the top of the t tallest tree. He was an old solitary and a wise one, but he was not wise enough to guess what it was all about. So all day long, he kept blinking and wondering. The noise reached far out over the plain and across the hills and awoke the little babes that were sleeping in their cradles. The smoke curled up towards the sun and shadowed the plain so that the stupid birds thought it was going to rain. But the wise one knew better. They are children, playing a game, thought he. I shall know more about it if I watch long enough. At the approach of night, they had all vanished away in their din and smoke. Then the old bird plumed his feathers. At last, he had understood. With a flap of his great black wings, he shot downward, circling toward the plain. A man was picking his way across the plain. He was dressed in the garb of a clergyman. His mission was to administer the consolations of religion to any of the prostrate figures in whom there might yet linger a spark of life. A negro accompanied him, bearing a bucket of water and a flask of wine. There were no wounded here. They had been borne away. But the retreat had been hurried, and the vultures and the good Samaritans would have to look to the dead. There was a soldier, a mere boy, lying with his face to the sky. His hands were clutching the sword on either side, and his fingernails were stuffed with the earth and bits of grass that he had gathered in his despairing grasp upon life. His musket was gone. He was hatless, and his face and clothing were begrimed. Around his neck hung a golden chain and locket. The priest, bending over him, unclasped the chain and removed it from the dead soldier's neck. He had grown used to the terrors of war and could face them unflinchingly. But its pathos, some way, always brought the tears to his old dim eyes. The Angelus was ringing half a mile away. 
The priest and the Negro knelt and murmured together the evening benediction and a prayer for the dead. The peace and beauty of a spring day had descended upon the earth like a benediction. Along the leafy road which skirted a narrow, torturous stream in central Louisiana rumbled an old-fashioned cabriolet, much the worse for hard and rough usage over the country roads and lanes. The fat black horses went in a slow measured trot, notwithstanding constant urging on the part of the fat black coachman. Within the vehicle were seated the fair Octavie and her old friend and neighbor, Judge Pillier, who'd come to take her for a morning drive. Octavie wore a plain black dress, severe in its simplicity. A narrow belt held it at the waist and the sleeves were gathered into close fitting wristbands. She discarded her hoop skirt and appeared not unlike a nun. Beneath the folds of her bodice nestled the old locket. She never displayed it now. It had returned to her sanctified in her eyes, made precious as material things sometimes are by being forever identified with the significant moment of one's existence. A hundred times she'd read over the letter with which the locket had come back to her. No later than that morning she had again pored over it. As she sat beside the window, smoothing the letter out upon her knee, Heavy and spiced odors stole into her with the songs of birds and the humming of insects in the air. She was so young, and the world was so beautiful that there came over her a sense of unreality as she read again and again the priest's letter. He told of that autumn day drawing to its close with the gold and the red fading out of the west and the night gathering its shadows to cover the faces of the dead. Oh, she could not believe that one of those dead was her own with visage uplifted to the gray sky in an agony of supplication. A spasm of resistance and rebellion seized and swept over her. Why was the spring here with its flowers and its seductive breath if he was dead? Why was she here? What further had she do with life and the living? Octavia had experienced many such moments of despair, but a blessed resignation had never failed to follow, and it fell then upon her like a mantle and enveloped her. I shall grow old and quiet and sad like poor Aunt Tavy, she murmured to herself as she folded the letter and replaced it in the secretary. Already she gave herself a little demure air like her Aunt Tavy. She walked with a slow glide and unconscious imitation of Mademoiselle Tavy, whom some youthful affliction had robbed of earthly compensation while leaving her in possession of youth's illusions. As she sat in the old cabriolet beside the father of her dead lover, again there came to Octavie the terrible sense of loss which had assailed her so often before. For the soul of her youth clamored for its rights, for a share in the world's glory and exultation. She leaned back and drew her veil a little closer about her face. It was an old black veil of her Aunt Tavi's. A whiff of dust from the road had blown in and she wiped her cheeks and her eyes with her soft white handkerchief, a homemade handkerchief, fabricated from one of her old fine muslin petticoats. Will you do me the favor, Octavie, requested the judge in courteous tone which he never abandoned, to remove that veil which you wear. It seems out of harmony some way with the beauty and promise of the day. The young girl obediently yielded to her old companion's wish and unpinning the cumbersome, somber drapery from her bonnet, folded it neatly and laid it upon the seat in front of her. Ah, that is better, far better, he said in a tone expressing unbounded relief. Never put it on again, dear. Octavie felt a little hurt, as if he, he wished to debar her from share and parcel in the burden of affliction which had been placed upon all of them. Again she drew forth the old muslin handkerchief. They had left the big road and turned into a level plain which had formerly been an old meadow. There were clumps of thorn trees here and there, gorgeous in their spring radiance. Some cattle were grazing off in the distance in spots where the grass was tall and luscious. At the far end of the meadow was the towering lilac hedge, skirting the lane that led to Judge Pillier's house, and the scent of its heavy blossoms met them like a soft and tender embrace of welcome. As they neared the house, the old gentleman placed an arm around the girl's shoulders, and turning her face up to him, he said, Do you not think that on a day like this miracles might happen? When the whole earth is vibrant with life, does it not seem to you, Octavie, that heaven might once relent and give us back our dead? He spoke very low, advisedly and impressively. In his voice was an old quaver which was not habitual, and there was agitation in every line of his visage. She gazed at him with eyes that were full of supplication and a certain terror of joy. 
They'd been driving through the lane with the towering hedge on one side and open meadow on the other. The horses had somewhat quickened their lazy pace. As they turned into the avenue leading to the house, a whole choir of feathered songsters fluted a sudden torrent of melodious greeting from their leafy hiding places. Octavia felt as though she'd passed into a stage of existence which was like a dream, more poignant and real than life. There was the old gray house with its sloping eaves, and amid the blur of green and dimly, she saw familiar faces and heard voices as if they came from far across the fields, and Edmund was holding her, her dead Edmund, her living Edmund, and she felt the beating of his heart against her and the agonizing rapture of his kisses striving to awake her. It was as if the spirit of life in their awakening spring had given back the soul to her youth and bade her to rejoice. It was many hours later that Octavia drew the locket from her bosom and looked at Edmund with a questioning appeal in her glance. It was the night before an engagement, he said. In the hurry of the encounter and the retreat the next day, I never missed it till the fight was over. I thought, of course, I'd lost it in the heat of the struggle, but it was stolen. Stolen, she shuddered and thought of the dead soldier with his face uplifted to the sky in an agony of supplication. Edmund said nothing, but he thought of his messmate, the one who had lain far back in the shadow, the one who had said nothing. <laughs>